Michael, if you are ready, I think I'll just do a quick intro. Are you ready to go? Ready to go. Ready. One, my name is Ellie Garrity, and I'm the manager of alumni career programming with the University of, Amer of Maryland Alumni Association. Huge welcome back to our presenters, Jerry Anathan and Michael Seelman, who will be leading today's TERP talk, Cultivating Resilience and Leading the Way Forward. This webinar is part of the Alumni Association's professional development webinar series in which we hope to provide thought-provoking and valuable content that will help alumni like you achieve your personal and professional goals. So Jerry and Michael have a lot of information to cover today and we want you to get the most out of this webinar. Our presenters have about an hour of interactive content to share with you and we'll be taking questions at the end. So feel free to utilize your chat box throughout the presentation. As Jerry said, with a small group like this, we'll really have a lot of time to answer questions and really cater things towards your needs. Now quickly about our presenters, I'm excited to introduce Jerry Anathan and UMD alumnus Michael Seelman. Jerry and Michael are both seasoned and experienced executive coaches with years of experience in leading remote teams and coaching leaders in times of crisis. Michael graduated from UND in 94 and among many accomplishments was a former student member of the University's System of Maryland Board of Regents. I'll pass it off to Jerry and Michael to share a little bit more about themselves and get things started. Go ahead, Jerry and Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. And uh, for those of you wondering, at the end, the, we'll have the slides will be sent to you. There'll be a link to the recording and some resources might be available to you as well. So uh, no worry about that. We just hope you all be present as we tell you about the information about how to be a resilient leader and navigate the way forward. So first about my background, I've had a global leadership coaching impact. I've coached over 100 leaders in North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. If you know of any clients that would like some coaching in South America, Antarctica, I'd like <laughs> to get all seven continents done. Um, but I help them bring out their best performance and a more fulfilled life. I'm coaching leaders during the pandemic at hospitals, at Amazon, Google, Reddit, Microsoft, and others. And so we're bringing lessons learned from those uh, client experiences as well. Like Jerry, I'm a psychological safety certified expert, and that's for helping teams be more psychologically safe, also certified up to the train the trainer level. Previously, I worked at the White House, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security. I had leadership roles in communications, employee engagement, knowledge management, innovation, IT, and national violence reduction. Uh, my remote team leadership techniques were highlighted in several books, and I also was a former member of the FBI Pandemic Flu Task Force, so I got to think of fun scenarios like the pandemic that we're in now. <laughs> and uh, I also have uh, some leadership scholarship background where I studied and collaborated with uh, Dr. James McGregor Burns, who won the Pulitzer Prize and was a visiting scholar at College Park when I was there. Also, Georgia Sorensen, who is a leadership scholar and was based at the University of Maryland. And Ron Heifetz, I did my master's program at Harvard, and he was head of the leadership program at, while I was there. Currently, I'm a doctoral student in organizational leadership in the University of Maryland system. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you, and thank both of you for um, having me here with you and all the other Terps. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, so my name is Jerry or Geraldine Anathan. I'm a leadership coach currently based in New York City, and I kind of share my time also in Provincetown, Massachusetts at the end of Cape Cod. So maybe about three quarters in New York, a quarter of the year there. Um, at the moment, most of my clients are first responders or frontline people with this COVID-19 situation. I'm working with several uh, physicians, ER doctors, and uh, a member of the, actually a chief at uh, the New York Fire Department. So it's been a pretty intense couple of um, maybe five or six weeks. But being, um, being involved in crisis management, I think allows like a nice trickle down for leaders because you can kind of take in the information and use it at your leisure, which is really great. Um, I've also coached in uh, four different refugee camps on the Thai-Burma border uh, back in 212, right at the, um, when there were a lot of border clashes on the, um, between the two countries. And so that was a very also amazingly intensive experience and lots of fun. Um, I love coaching. Uh, I'll be quick. I'll just finish up. I'm also, um, as Michael mentioned, 
uh, psychological safety is a huge part of what we do. And we work with small teams to help them uh, become more highly productive and break down any communication barriers that might exist. I'm also a graduate student in a master's program for organizational psychology at Harvard Extension. And again, I'm just really pleased to be here to, um, to present to you about resilience and how you can foster it for you and people you care about, your teams, your, your work environment. Thank you, Jerry. Thank so you. <laughs> our agenda today is, well, what is resilience? Jerry mentioned it and it's in uh, the headline for our webinar today. So we're gonna talk about what that definition is and how it plays a role in neuroscience. We'll also talk about three will ways to build your resilience. And then we're gonna be talking about navigating that way forward about the phased return to work, how to do contingency planning, and then how you can envision success for yourself, your team, and your stakeholders. Great, so here we just have a sort of a symbolic idea of what resilience is. It's sort of standing, you know, your feet are, your feet are well grounded, but you're also able to maybe throw a punch if you need to, <laughs> and you have energy that's, that's created within you know, within your, within your own self. So I'm just gonna read the definition. Um, one of the definitions for you might be, it's the process of successfully adapting in the face of adversity, trauma, threat, or stress. Um, and it really means bouncing back. Michael and I like to think of it as sort of like bouncing or bounding forward because we're going into a sort of an uncharted territory at this point. Resilience, uh, resilience is not a trait that people either have or don't have. You might be more inclined genetically to be resilient than others, but anyone can learn it. And it involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed really by anyone. And so there's also different aspects that you can think of for resilience. And so Jerry and I put down three here. The first is planning for positive outcomes despite high risk situations. So you might think, okay, uh, it's hard right now to, to, with this VUCA, this volatile, uncertain, uh, complex and ambiguous environment that we're in. It might be hard to plan for the future. So we'll talk with you about how to do contingency planning. But an aspect of resilience is that you're able to think ahead and with a positive outlook, with some hope for the future and despite the uh, challenges that we're having now. The second thing that we wanted to share of aspect of resilience is remaining competent in the face of stress. So we're not here saying that you're not stressed or that you won't have down times. But resilience is that even when you're having those challenges and you're having these down times, that you can still be competent. You can still exercise leadership. You can still carry out your job. I shared with Jerry that I was doing a webinar on positivity. And the night before, I was kind of having a little down uh, emotional time. I wasn't feeling at my best. And, um, so I was like, how am I gonna do a webinar on positivity, creating a culture of positivity the next day? Well, I reached out to my family. I, said, I kind of saw the irony in it. You know, I just was, was trying to figure out how I can stay competent by reaching out to others and having that positive attitude going forward. So again, we're not saying that you're not gonna have downtime or that it won't be difficult or stressful. It's just how do you remain competent when you're in those situations? And then the third bullet point we have is using challenges for personal growth. So if you start thinking about this time, this is a time to rise to the equation. This is a time to, uh, of challenge and use that kind of word when you think about it in your head or how you discuss with others. This is a, a time to, um, to rise and to, to plan, to exercise your best so you can make those future hardships more manageable. Again, it's not saying that we deny that it's gonna be challenging, but just that we recognize with a sense of competence that we can face it and we can overcome. Jerry? Yes, so, you know, before we can move forward, sometimes we have to understand what's really going on. And when we are faced with a crisis or a, a really big challenge, the physiological response is that the brain gets very, very narrow with its lens. And that's why we have a picture of a lens here. Um, and so what's happening is, you know, the, you've got this crisis, you've got this threat coming, um, and so you, you know what that is, it's COVID-19, coronavirus, it's, a, it's fear around that, but then it is the fear itself that creates sort of another a pervasive 
threat. So yes, there's the virus, and then there's the fear that's really begins to, to ebb away at your, your own resilience. You know, it's, it's hitting your uh, parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system and just creating a very small space where we, we kind of freeze up. So what we want to do is just really try to be aware of that. And so if you find yourself going into a place, you're breathing more quickly, you're feeling more stress, just know it's just your brain. It's not you, it's your brain reacting to a new set of circumstances. And there are ways to move, to move through that by broadening the lens. Thank you, Jerry. And the next thing we wanted to do was to share with you this quote, and it's this. Research indicates that by simply reframing, we want to emphasize that, our appraisal of an event from a threat to a challenge, we can improve our physiological, emotional, and behavioral responses to the stressor. This ultimately contributes to personal resilience. And you see the citation there. So again, we're not saying that you ignore that there's a threat, but you reframe the way you look at it, the way you speak about it, to being a challenge, that that's something you can rise to the occasion of. And when Jerry and I were talking about this slide, uh, Jerry had a great idea of putting in this uh, Chinese character. And if you take apart the character, what this says here is that crisis equals both danger and opportunity. So again, we're not ignoring the danger, the health danger, the economic danger of the situation right now, but we're saying that in that, there can be an opportunity to serve. Just like Jerry said, and I thought, well, let's get out there, share our expertise around uh, as we're coaching leaders, as we're helping people with their resilience, as we're helping them navigate their way forward, why not get out there with a free webinar that we can help others too? We saw this as an opportunity for us as well. Really well put, that's so true. So there are three basic pr protective factors that are characteristics of people who, who have resilience. So in psychology and neuropsychology, if you've studied either of them in, to any level, there are what's called risk factors and protective factors. And those can kind of swap in and out through the lifetime and in, depending on where your culture is, how you grew up, a lot of external and internal circumstances. But there are these three protective factors that, are, that kind of weave a thread through everybody that does exhibit a lot of resilience. The first one is a high level of self-confidence. So now that doesn't mean that you're cocky. It means that you know what you've got to do to get to the next step. You feel confident in the decisions you make and you're able to help others, even though you may be a little nervous or feel like you're under a lot of stress, you are able to reach out, help others around you and, and be a leader. And it also means that you're confident enough to know that the decisions you make today may not be the, the right decision tomorrow or the next day, but they're the right decision for now. And sometimes just having the confidence to make a decision is really all you need to feel better about yourself. When we're in doubt, there's, again, that's, that whole brain fog happens, cognitive overload of looking at all these different options. So making a decision, knowing that you can reverse most decisions is a nice thought to have as you move forward. The other is simply to have disciplined routines, and this means work and within your own personal life. Um, studies just show that, it, you know, that those people who are sort of organized, they know how their day is going along, they get to sleep at the right times, they wake up at the right times. Those people seem to have a higher degree of resilience. The last part, and this is a part that, you know, the, these first two you might be able to identify in others, quite possibly, but this last part you never quite know what another person's social and family support looks like. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that your own uh, family, your friends, your community, or even you know, your work environment, those connections that are important to you, it's very, it's, it's integral that you keep those connections open, clear, transparent, and um, even compassionate, you know, having compassion for the people in your world, as stressed as you may be, uh, but it's definitely, um, a really big factor with uh, staying resilient. So these three things, if you can do these three things and kind of keep them in your mind, self-confidence, routines, and connection is really important. Jerry, if I could just build on what you said, like in the example I gave about the day before that webinar, that's what I did. I, at first, my natural inclination is maybe to come in on myself when I'm not feeling as strong, but I've tried to learn to go out and, and I went, asked my wife, can I have a hug? You know, I went, 
bike riding with my seven-year-old in the morning in the sunshine. You know, I reached out for that social and family support to help build me back up to bounce forward as we talked about. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, you don't have to be a strong, you don't have to appear strong all the time to be resilient. It's nice to be able to be vulnerable and resilient at the same time. So Especially really with family and friends, right? Absolutely. That's yes. Awesome. So, you know, Michael and I were thinking about when we talk about leadership and the way things have changed over the last months, um, just this onslaught of change, let's just say we were thinking about, wow, remember, you know, those times when you just feel like you're a hundred percent, you're, you're on fire, you're, you're, everything's just going right. Like every piston is firing. So what we wanted to do was talk about, you know, actually give you an experiment, a way of um, doing a, like a, a piece of art to talk about what it feels like when you have all pistons firing. So in a moment, Michael's going to put up a slide. And if you can see the little letters at the top, Michael, could you read those to us? You're gonna go sure. to another browser and just put in menti.com, first of all. Yeah, you could do it in another browser tab. You could do it on your phone. And what you wanna do is to go to www.menti.com. And when you get there, you'll be prompted to enter a code. And if you enter this code, 1114, 67. Again, that code is 111467. Go to menti.com and you enter it. And we'd like you to answer the question, what does it feel like when you have all pistons firing? If you could enter just one or two words, what we're going to have is a word cloud up here. And is the screen, is the screen showing now for everyone, Jerry? It is. It's okay. showing the instructions, yes. Oh, great. So if you could go again to www dot menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. Ah, uh, see some of you found it. The words are appearing. It's a mag magic. Uh, so this is a word cloud that we'll see. Um, oh, so I hear accomplishment, fireworks, easy, cohesive, smooth. That's terrific. Super cool. If you want to put more words in, go ahead. But, you know, we love doing this because it creates art. It engages the brain. And it makes a beautiful thing to take home. <laughs> we like to take screenshots and kind of make a little collage of them. So, you know, it's also something you could use with your teams as leaders. It's always nice to throw in these, these um, kind of uh, platforms or tools or tricks that help really create engagement for your audience. Even if it's just a few people on a meeting, it's a really nice way to kind of break it up, bring some color and art into the scene. And if, cool. if you're trying to do it with your team, then you would go to Mentimeter. That's where you set up these uh, word clouds. And when you share it with the audience, they have the shortened version, the menti.com. So we also wanted to give you some tools that you can use with your team. Super fun. I love the words. What do we have? Productive, confident, rush, flow, cohesive, power. Awesome. So those words, even as you say them to yourselves, and think about those words. Just notice if it changes your, your energy in your body at all or your mind. Just a fun little thing, you know, having that self-awareness, taking, a, taking a, step, a step back and seeing how you're feeling, if it changes anything for you to tap into those. All right, Jerry, ready to go back to our PowerPoint presentation? I am. I'm ready right. if you are. I'm ready. Here we go. You're seeing the slides now? Yes. Awesome. So this is just an overview, really, of the, th the going into this section about building resilience. So there are three, three really building blocks to, to creating that resilience. One is to practice self-care. Uh, the second is to allow for a flexible mindset. And the third is to take strategic actions. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about self-care. And, you know, you've probably had that term thrown at you quite a bit during this entire um, experience of the crisis and, and just being a remote leader and maybe even before being a remote leader. Um, but, you know, it's easy to talk about uh, self-care and to know about self-care, but rarely do we actually practice it for ourselves. So Michael and I are just going to challenge you over the next few days that each day you really pay attention to how you're treating your body and your, your mind as well. So part of self-care, of course, is getting really good sleep if you can eating properly, you know, 
taking a shower every day. For some people, that's really hard. I hear people like, oh, I've been in my sweatpants for five days. Nobody knows, you know, but you know, you can you shake it up by just like getting a cold shower or a hot shower, whatever feels good for you. Um, and also, you know, what happens is we're not able to do those same recreational activities, perhaps that we were doing before. So it's finding substitutes. Um, you know, if you can't perhaps play racquetball with your, with your buddies, maybe you find something else with your kid, you can play ping pong. I don't know, there are a lot of different examples. Um, but, you know, one big part of self-care is taking the time to center your body. And so as we were talking before about what happens with the brain during crisis, is that as we continue to be stressed, we create a lot of uh, cortisol, which is shot into the bloodstream. And cortisol is a totally bad thing. And there are two ways to get rid of cortisol. One is to do a really vigorous activity. And the second is to just do a very quick breathing exercise. And so Michael, would you like to advance the slide and we'll try to do an experiment all of us together. Before we do that, I gotta take a sip of this smoothie. That looks so good, Jerry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> those raspberries. Okay, I'll, I'll take, take a little sip. Okay, now I'm ready to advance. Okay, good, excellent. Now that you're, now that you're, um, you've got your liquid protein, you're, you're ready to roll. Okay, so this is really fun, let's see. What I'd love for everyone to do right now, if you are on your couch, if you're kicked back, stay where you are. But if you're in a chair and you're kind of, your posture is a little tight. I want you to just put both feet on the floor and kind of shake out your shoulders and drop them back and down. Okay. And just begin to let your shoulders get heavy and your thighs get heavy. And take a very slow, big inhale, nice and long. And imagine the breath just coming up through the soles of the feet from the center of the earth. And hold the breath in just for a moment. And then as you exhale, allow your eyes to float closed. And if you don't want to close your eyes, you can just let them be lazy. Relax your mouth and your jaw and the space between your eyes. One more when you're ready. Nice, big, slow inhale. And as you're inhaling this time, imagine you're sipping it up through a straw, right through the center of the body, center channel of the body, filling the lungs, sides of the lungs as though they're wings and the backs of the lungs along the shoulder blades into the neck. And exhale when you're ready, if you haven't. And then this last one, as though you're sipping it through a straw. So how slowly can you take the deepest inhale? So slow that you can feel it coming up through, again, through the legs, through the belly, up through the mid body, the upper body, your neck into the back of the head and maybe even out the crown of the head. And when you're ready, just let it go. And then if the eyes are still closed on your next inhale, just let them flutter open. And if they're already open, just give yourself a shake. And then let's return back to the energy we had a couple moments ago, but maybe just feeling a little different. And if you do feel different at all, I'd love for you to just pop into the chat what you might feel like right now after doing that breathing exercise. And as you notice, it only took about a minute and a quarter and it literally removes the cortisol from your system. It's the only way you can do it is through these deep breathing techniques and moving the body. So if you have any kind of sensation after that, we'd love to hear it in the group chat. And if not, maybe you've all fallen asleep and that's okay too. <laughs> you know, Jerry, I was just imagining that raspberry smoothie coming slowly through the straw <laughs> into my body. Can I just keep my eyes closed the rest of the time? Or do I... <laughs> yeah, hey, you should do these in the middle of the night like a slumber party. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad to hear Anne is feeling peaceful. That's good, that's so good. Awesome, terrific. So Jerry got us in the right mindset. She helped us uh, those how those chemicals that aren't so helpful, the cortisol, kind of settle down so we can be in a different kind of mindset. And we're going to talk about what's the helpful mindset that 
is going to help you be that resilient leader and help your team navigate the way forward. That's what I'm going to get into next. And there was these P's of the mindset that we have. The first P that we want to talk about is that the situation we're in, it is not permanent, right? It might think that um, it's been a long time that we might have been sheltering at home and uh, kind of quarantining ourselves. Uh, might feel like a long time, but this is not permanent. It's not permanent. And when Jerry and I were thinking about what image we might share on this slide to, to typify that mindset of things are not permanent, I was thinking about if you remember the Exxon Valdez oil spill or the BP oil spill, that sometimes we saw birds coated in the tar, with their wings gloppy, uh, the oil dripping off of them. And it just looked like, is nature ever going to recover from these, from these uh, oil disasters that we had? And they did, right? We were able to clean these things up. Nature was about to come back into homostasis, come back into some balance. And so we picked this image of birds flying again as an image of just realizing you can think towards that hopeful future that this is not permanent and this too shall pass as other things. That's, that's so true, Michael. And the other thing, you know, it sometimes feels like everywhere you look is this, this like the onslaught or the after effect of this crisis. And that is a thing that is such a part of perception. So not to say that it isn't, in a lot of places, or it may feel like a lot of places, but the truth of the matter is it's not pervasive. It's many places, but it's not uh, in the chair that you're sitting in. It's not the table in front of you or the desk or this laptop that you're looking into. You, know, you still have access to play an instrument, sit in the sun, do a yoga posture, play with your family or your dog, read a book, cook, play music, play games. So we have to put things into a perspective that works for us because perspective, what does that mean? It's our personal view, the lens through which we look at any situation. So we can literally choose how to create our relationship with what's going on. And that means not allowing it to be pervasive. I like that, Jerry. It makes me think of, and in the past, even before pandemic, there was times when I was maybe so focused on my job that, um, and I, I was just focused on that aspect of my life, that if things weren't going well with my job, it was so tied to the way I perspective I had my own identity, that when things were not going well with my job, then I was like, things are not going well with me and everything in my life. And But if I step back and I said, wait, that's only one aspect of my life. There's my family that I'm just so blessed to have my family members. There's uh, social activities I do. There's friends in my life. That there's so many other aspects of my life then I could get some perspective on, on one part of my life that's maybe not the way I'd like it to be. Awesome. So let's go look at our third P. And that is that it's not personal. <laughs> Jerry and I were looking at this, we're like, this is pretty intense, having a finger pointing at you like that. Right? It might feel personal right now. It might feel like because the coronavirus and the economic effects might be affecting us personally, but it's not about us. There is uh, one of the things that's, say is like this is happening all across the world right now we have a community of people that are have similar challenges to the ones we're having now that are trying to band together to overcome it i have a, a friend in italy uh and i reached out to her and i'm like well you know what's it like in italy and they, what are they doing they, they're doing the social distancing but to come together they get out in their balconies and they're singing together right so they're banding together because there's other people that are going it's not just about us so it might feel pretty intense, like that finger pointing at you, like we have in that image. But if we realize that it's not just about us, and there's other people that we can reach out to, that we can be a part of, that is, that's not just focused on us, even though it's affecting us, that can help us with that more healthier mindset. Awesome. Jerry, is there anything you wanted to add to that one? No, I think, I think it's really great to know, you know, you didn't create it and you can't fix it. And so let's get some perspective, another P, <laughs> you know? There you go. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about is this anxiety and stress. And what happens again is that the more we tap into stress, the more we make bad decisions. Uh, we create breakdown in our own minds and bodies um, through an overload of chemicals and, and, and neurotransmitters when we're in a negative mind space. And it also creates burnout where 
you know, it's very hard to recuperate once you've really burned out. Um, I'm doing actually a project on burnout for one of my uh, courses. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things that it's like a tipping point. Once you go beyond that point, it's hard to come out of it. It's a, it's a literal burnout and breakdown. So we want to just keep, we're, we're kind of hammering you over the head with this to tap into the high, the high side of all of this. You know, it makes me think of, uh, Jerry, is sometimes we talk about the vicious cycle, like you start getting stressed, you start distancing yourself from others, like not reaching out and being yeah. social connections. You focus on one aspect of your life. That can be that vicious cycle. What we're suggesting is says get in this virtuous cycle where you reach out, you get help, you realize it's not permanent, it's not personal. That will help you get back into this healthy building cycle. Absolutely. And so, uh, speaking of cycles and circles, uh, now what we wanted to do is to share with you something that Stephen Covey did that he got from Viktor Frankl, who is a Holocaust survivor. It's called the uh, Circle of Influence. And this is something that I do often with my clients as we would talk about when they have different situations about, we first look at what is in their control. And I'm gonna put the C here for control. So the circle of what we can actually control might be relatively small, right? That's so we have absolute control over it. And then a bit wider than that might be what we call our circle influence. These are things we might not be able to totally control, but we can certainly influence if we're being that, exercising that competence that we talked about earlier. And then sometimes wider than that can be this, circle of concern. So we have first the circle of control, then we have the circle of influence, and then we can have this circle of concern. So uh, for instance, sometimes, because I, I worked at the White House and I worked at a large federal agency, sometimes I, during this crisis, have had this big circle of concern, thinking it would be nice if our country did this. It'd be great if our government did that. And sometimes it's wider than what I can influence. I'm not working at those places right now. I'm not in some of those positions of leadership. So what I could focus on is I said, okay, I, I got control. I can uh, my control my own emotions. I can reach out for help. I can develop a sense of community. Then there's things that I could influence. I said, I have some skill sets. I've, I've, I'm a coach. I have clients that can help my clients. I can do webinars. There's things that I can influence to help other people right now that I, I can. And if I focus on the, can, the control and the influence, then that can expand outwards, right? If I, if I don't dissipate my energy, then this circle of influence can be expanding outwards. Gotta love my arrows here, Jerry. Don't you love my drawing here? Um, so you can, you can just keep pushing outwards your circle of influence when you focus your energies there. If we so focus our energies too much on our circle of concern beyond what we can realistically influence, then there's will dissipate our energy. We'll get in that vicious cycle that we talked about. So what we're encouraging you to just think about that circle of control, that circle of influence, focus your energies there. What can you do? What are small steps you can do now? And then as you do that, you'll find your circle of influence will grow and you'll have, be able to exercise more control and influence over your environment. That's great, Michael. And you know what that reminds me of is what I was talking about earlier, the risk and protective factors. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can, you can think of anything that's going on in your life and figure out where does it fit on that circle. Terrific. Yeah. And so now I'm going to remember just as we practice, I'm going to first erase. So oh, wouldn't it be easy to make the coronavirus disappear like just as easily as I can. Bye-bye, <laughs> coronavirus. There we go. And uh, so then I'm going to go on to our next slide. Let's see. Oop, I better get out of my eraser. I got too excited about my eraser. Turn off. That's in your circle of concern, I guess. Better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there we go. Now I'll advance the slide. Awesome. So the next part we want to talk about is taking action. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to think about our self-care, our mindset, all these different other aspects, but that's all about thinking. That's between the two ears. And again, we're talking about staying in our heads. So we want to now take action. So one of the first things I like to have my clients do when they're in sort of a rut is every day, just get up, 
and reframe your personal goals. What do you need to do today? What is it that's gonna make you feel good? What's one step forward that you can take? So you think of your goals, you create a small action step. And that's really all that you need to do is one little thing at a time. And it, it works beautifully. One thing that's nice is to, um, to remember what those things were by either, either keeping like a gratitude journal or just writing it down in your journal. Here's the stuff I did today and, and I did it. That gets it out of your head onto paper and you've already done the action. So the third thing that's really important, and we've emphasized this, and, and Michael's brought it up about how he you know, spoke to his family when he wasn't feeling great. I've talked about reaching out to people in your, in your circle. It's super important to connect because it releases oxytocin and serotonin into the bloodstream, just like that terrible hormone or neurotransmitter that can go through your body, um, the cortisol, this is feel good chemicals that go through your body. So sometimes you might, you know, you might not be in the mood to do a Zoom call with your, you know, your extended family of 15 people <laughs> during dinner. It's not what you wanna do, but there's something that you can get out of it. Just seeing one another's eyes, making that connection. It's important to keep doing that sometimes even when you really don't necessarily want to. Plus, it's not all about you. You might be really helping someone else just by reaching out, being present with them for just a few moments. You know, Jerry, you found this lovely image of, uh, you know, a runner taking that small step and, you know, seeing these, uh, these sneakers on made me think about, I had this one client that had some exercise goals and we say, like, what can you do as a small step? Like you were emphasizing so small that you'll actually just start and build some momentum and like, well, how about if you just set the goal to have, do one push up a day, one. And uh, it's like, there's almost no reason why you couldn't do it, right? So you get up, you do that one push up, and then you get some momentum. You're like, well, I'm already down here on the floor. I might as well at least do two push ups, right? And so that's what we're talking about. Just get that started. Just start, take some small action, and then it starts building this beautiful momentum. Excellent. So true. So for this moment, as we, we're gonna move into how you lead your organization forward in a moment, but if you have any questions about resilience right now, questions, concerns, comments, just throw them into the chat box and we'll be able to address them by the end of the webinar most likely. So feel free to give any comments, any questions. Uh, the chat box is right down there with the little, the little um, thought bubble. Bubble, bubble, yes, the thought bubble. So put your <laughs> thoughts into that bubble if you'd like to. Thanks so much, Jay. So in this next section, we're gonna be talking about leading the way forward. So um, it's, it's gonna be different, right? It's gonna be different. And so how can you navigate, lead that way forward during these different times? How can you be that lead boat of the paper boats there <laughs> that others are looking to you for leadership? How can you do that with confidence like we talked about? So the first part of our webinar we talked about uh, how you can build up your personal resilience or how you can help others build up their resilience. And now because we, we did that logically, like, you know, first you have to be there. It's kind of like when you, you if you're, the, the days when we used to go on airplanes, right? Um, sometimes I say, if, if there's a change in cabin pressure and the oxygen mask comes forward, it says, uh, make sure if you're traveling with children, you put the mask on yourself first before you put it on your children. The same is true with you and your team and the others counting on you. You have to take care of yourself. You have to build that, those habits of resilience before you can lead the way forward for others. Put that oxygen mask on force first so you don't faint or collapse when you're trying to help others. So that's why we put that part of the webinar first. And what we, there's different parts of leading the way forward. So the first is we have this graphic to talk about when we go back to work. There's some states that are opening back up. Some countries in the world have opened back up after a uh, kind of a lockdown period. So what's that gonna look like? Because we're gonna talk about contingency planning in just a moment. So we wanna say, well, let's, let's think about what that future is gonna look like. Jerry and I believe that the future is gonna be fragile, it's gonna be partial, and it's gonna be really important to take into account individual circumstances. So what do we mean by partial, fragile, those things? So partial, it's not like we're gonna open up the doors to the office building, everyone's gonna be parading in uh, side by side, giving people slaps on the back, high fives. It's gonna be different in the future. We might have people going back in shifts where not all the workforce will be able to be there at once because they're probably gonna to have to keep social distancing guidelines. They might have to wear a mask. As you enter the building, someone might be taking your temperature. 
as uh, you go in. Your hallways might have one-way hallways so that you're not crossing people uh, breathing on each other. You might have one-way direction hallways. There might be plexiglass so separating cubicles or there might be people sitting several cubicles apart or having dividers that are up. Um, you might have more voice activated things as, as opposed to push button. You know, there's, there's ways that our workplaces and our work routines will be different even as we start the partial return to work. Uh, there might be some people that say, if you can work from home, please continue to work from home. And so there'll be also individualized circumstances. Perhaps you or someone on your team might have be immunocompromised. And so they might not be able to risk going back to work, even if they're not immunocompromised. One of your colleagues may have someone at their household that is. Uh, one of my friends is recovering from cancer right now. So he has to be very careful. Anyone that comes into his household could bring the coronavirus in for him and he's immunocompromised. So we gotta be very careful about that. And uh, you might have conversations with your, your colleagues about it. It might be uncomfortable for some people. They might not like the idea of their temperature being taken. Uh, you might not, if you have a cafeteria in your building, you might not be eating in a cafeteria. You might be sitting in your car eating your lunch so that people can keep distance or, or in place they can sit pretty far apart. So things will be different even as we start this return to work. What we mean by fragile is there could be different outbreaks. It could be someone in your office building that tests positive for coronavirus, and then people might be sent home again saying, please don't come into the office. There might be deeper cleaning of the office. In the meantime, there might be next flu season. We could have another pretty big outbreak of coronavirus. Um, so that we're going to be flexible because that return to work is going to be fragile. It could be kind of broken at any time or we have to be ready to go back to other circumstances to have contingencies in place. And that's why we wanted to lead into this next slide. Jerry? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of companies before this pandemic happened had con contingency plans or alternate plans or uh, sort of emergency plans, but many, many, many companies did not. So depending on where you are in your organization, you know, you don't have to be the CEO of your company to be really proactive and come up with contingency plans. And in fact, I would encourage you to just think if you were the leader of your company, um, if you're not, what would that look like? And so there's, there's a process that is a very deep, deep process. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes a lot of kind of thought and potentially collaboration. But I'm just gonna outline it briefly because we certainly don't have time to get deep into this. But this is, um, uh, a plan that, that's used by one of the, the, the um, certifications that I have called the Center for Executive Coaching. It's what we use with our clients when we're helping them create optional plans for the future. So the first thing you want to do, it's a four-step process. The first thing you would do is, you know, sit down and list all the different parts of the organization that have been affected or could be affected by a crisis. So for example, it could be anything from uh, hiring policies, staffing plans, contingencies, supply chain, uh, shifting demands for products, maybe your management, um, the property and the facilities that you've got now, layoffs, furloughs, recruiting, marketing. I mean, there, there are many, many categories. And if someone wants to talk about this at another time, I'm happy to do that with you. But you want to kind of just take a big list, a big inventory of all the things that may be impacted by any kind of a crisis. So the second thing you want to do is choose different scenarios to consider. So for example, um, I mean, there could be all kinds of scenarios, right? It could just be that there's a fire. It could be that your water supply or your electricity is shut off for days on end. But here we've got a pandemic, which is a, a, a big, big uh, situation that many people weren't planning for. So for example, with this virus, there are two, I would say two things that are very relevant variables. And that is the length of the crisis. How long is it going to last? I mean, that's been a big puzzle. Michael and I have dealt with a lot of um, a lot of our clients and the webinars we've been giving about how do you get your head around when is this going to change? So how long might this last? It could be a week. It could be years. We don't know yet. The second part is to think about the severity of that crisis or challenge. So, you know, is it is it super severe? Is it mildly severe? 
And so when you create a couple, just two, two options for the severity of it, you can then kind of combine those things. So it could be short and not severe. It could be short and severe. It could be long and not severe, or it could be long and severe. And that helps you lay out what happens next. So now what we're going to do is combine those first two steps. And typically what I'll have my clients do is create a chart and you're pairing each variable together and then thinking about what would the outcome of that be? How can you protect the company? How can you protect your staff? How can you protect you know, your merchandise, your properties, all those types of things. And again, there are a lot of ways to analyze this. Um, what we try to do is like help our clients not get you know, analysis paralysis where you're, all you're doing is trying to think of these scenarios that haven't yet happened. But just to have a basic outline for these potential scenarios is really good. Um, and there are a lot of ways you can do it. You can do it in a chart. You can do it in a more of a list. Um, but these are just some ways to think about it. Then your, the fourth step is simply to summarize your insights. Um, look at how the overall business has to change, whether it's during the crisis or after the crisis is over. Um, you know, outcomes might be something like, which we've already done. Almost, I would say, everybody is certainly here. If you weren't digital before, you're 100% digital right now. You know, creating a staffing model that easily flexes up and down, um, storing cash or having uh, cash on hand for a rainy day type situation, diversifying your supply chain, um, you know, creating different ways to gain market share. So it's a, it's, a, it's a laborious project, but it really, you know, then when the crisis hits, you've got that contingency plan, you pick it up and you know what to do. And it truly works. Um, it's funny when this with, just reminds me of my own story um, before, way before there was an announcement of, um, you know, stay at home policies or anything like that. Uh, my partner and I put together a big contingency plan uh, that had come from her organization that she actually implemented at her organization. And it was a family plan. If one person gets sick, here's where they go. If the next person gets sick, here's what we do. If, if the school is closed, we go to our other home. You know, it was all, it was very, very specific, you know, and it, it taught me a lot about planning and trusting the plan because we all put, to get, put it together as a family. So that was a really interesting experience. You know, you can do it for your family, you can do it for your organization, you can do it for your community. But it, it, it's a security blanket. When the thing hits, you know what to do next. So Michael, I'll hand it back to you. Jerry, I love that you talked about both how it can be in our uh, corporations, but it can also be in our families, the other groups that we're in. Uh, it made me think of um, some of the small companies that, that my family interacts with, like they went online with my son's like Taekwondo classes. They have, they were able to do that pivot pretty well, that, that contingency planning. And then our own family, like, okay, my wife and I are talking about, what if this kids don't go back to school in the fall? What are we going to do then? You know, just thinking about that process, thinking ahead and planning as a family like you did with your partner. Thank you for that. Sure. So next, what we wanted to do is to have you think about that success. As we talked about, it's important to to have that hope for the future, that forecast. And so we got this lovely image of a woman leaping into the future with this uh, great expression, the sun in, in the background. And uh, as Jerry said, we don't know uh, when things will get back to the normal that we were used to. Uh, sometimes, hopefully in the 20 somethings, um, you know, that uh, we would get back to that. So we kind of cut off the years after the 2020s, probably sometime in the 2020s. Uh, we don't know exactly. Jerry, do you want to get in there? No, yeah. I, I think that's that's right. You know, I, I remember when I just kind of finally wrapped my head around the fact that this was not going away this week. <laughs> it was yeah. not, not an easy realization, but it, it's incredible how envisioning the future and envisioning success, um, what that looks like for me. Like, it doesn't have to look a certain way. It can look, it can look like it looks, like we were talking about perception, you know? Yes. Great, right. but having a hope towards the future and trying to envision it. So what we wanna invite you to do is similar when we did the Jerry Let Us in the meditation exercise, we want you now to, to get comfortable, maybe you can get a good posture, I always have to kind of adjust my posture there. And we're gonna ask you, you can keep your eyes open or keep your eyes closed, we can't tell. Um, uh, so we want you to try to envision the future and we're gonna just walk you through that. So as I'm talking about it, I want you to think about it. So let's say that future is six months or a year from now. 
Let's start with you personally. What do you want that future to look like for yourself? What do you want your family to look like, your loved ones, your household? And when you look back at your time now, how do you hope that you showed up and addressed the challenges? So now remember when Jerry talked about the lens, now we're gonna widen the lens a little bit from you and your family, the team that you're on at work, or it could be a larger family team, or your community group. When you widen that lens, remember that great graphic that Jerry had of that camera. When you're widening the lens and envisioning success of not just what you can control, but things that you can influence, groups that you can influence, what do you want that to look like six months from now? a year from now. What do you need to do now in the next few weeks, the next few months to make that success happen for those groups that you're envisioning? How do you want to show up? When people are looking back and talking about your performance, how you showed up, what you did for them, what do you want them to be saying a year from now? Now we're going to widen the lens a little bit further and we're going to look at Say you're a team leader, the people on your team that you're leading, or the people in that community group, or the others in your family that you're leading. What do you want their life to look like six months or a year from now? What's the success you want them to have that you can influence, that you can show up for, that you can help take a small step towards today, tomorrow, and in the coming weeks? And let's widen that lens a still further and say for the people that are stakeholders of your family, of yourself, of your company, of the groups that you're a part of, what, how do you want them to be looking at the role you, your team, your community group, your family played? What do you want them to be thinking about what you did during this time? When they're reflecting back a year from now, how would you like them to be thinking about that? What would success mean for them that you can contribute to? So just really capture those images. Maybe some images came to your mind, envisioning that success. And in the coming days and weeks, keep that in mind as you overcome these challenges. We're not saying there won't be them, but keep in mind that that's what you're hopeful for, that's what you're striving for, and you're taking small steps towards each day. We'd like you to keep that in mind. Jerry? It was a really nice exercise, Michael. It felt wonderful to think about those, those, visualize the future like that. So if you have the energy, we would love for you to pop into the chat. What's the first step you'll take to build resilience to help you start on the path toward your envisioned success? So we mean the very first step. You've got a weekend coming up in front of you. Maybe it's tomorrow. You know, definitely having that self-care. But what does that look like for you? We'd love to hear specifically what is that first step you'll take to build some resilience. And Jerry, as people are putting that in the chat, if I could say, Jerry and I recognize that we've covered a lot of material. This is a lot to absorb at one time. So we're available to you. You can reach out to us on LinkedIn. Uh, also, Ellie will be sending out a follow-up email with links of how you can get complimentary free coaching sessions with Jerry and I to kind of talk about this. We covered a lot of content and it, it was general by nature because we don't know how it applies to you. But if you want to, you can meet with us and we'll, in a free coaching session, talk about how you can apply it to your specific circumstances, some of the lessons that we shared in this webinar. So we wanted to give you that opportunity. Um, that will come in the follow-up email that uh, Ellie will be sending out to share how you can schedule those free coaching sessions with us. Or you can reach out to us on LinkedIn, ask us any questions that you might have. But we do have some time now to, uh, if you'd like to ask us some questions. Hey, Michael, we did have one question um, from Ann who asked, how do we, or anybody, deal with leaders, deal with difficult people. Great. So I'm going to take it off the screen share now so uh, people can see us. So the question was, how can we as leaders deal with difficult people? 
Yes, negative right. people was the actual word, yeah. Negative people, thank you. So one thought I have, and you can chime in too, Jerry, uh, is that um, first approach it with some compassion, right? Um, I think each of us has our good times and our, our hard times. I shared one of mine. And um, so we can reach out compassion. See, you know, gosh, I wonder what's going on with their life right now. Uh, a lot of a, a coaching theme that shows up a lot when Jerry and I are coaching is people feeling out of control, right? And when people feel out of control, they might not show up in their best way. It may not be their best day. And to have some compassion to that. And uh, generally what we do as coaches is we ask open-ended questions, not accusatory or judgmental questions, but how are you doing? What can I do to help? And then that might soften those people that are, that are challenging to deal with. And then once we help them, then they might be open to helping us and working with us. They might have more capacity to do the things that we'd like them to do. Jerry, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I think that's right. I think we don't know sometimes what someone's going through and why they're negative. I mean, some people just sort of are, in, their inclination is to be cranky, you know, but other people might be going through something uh, that we're not that we're not certain about. Um, yeah, I've dealt with a lot of leaders who have difficult people, and what I find is usually those people are very sensitive. They're they're acting out of fear. There's something going on that we're not aware of, and just treating them with compassion. It's hard. It's it's awkward. It's difficult. But just knowing that you know they, you know like like you, they have pains and they have suffering. We don't know what that is, and just trying to trying to stay in that mindset with that focus. And we'd love to continue to take questions after the hour, but uh, I think Ellie will officially wrap us up and then Jerry and I are happy to hang out beyond the hour to answer any other questions you might have. Ellie, over to you. Awesome, thank you. I actually do have a question for you to see if we can spark some some other questions from the audience. But um, I know we discussed resilience earlier on in your presentation, and I had a question for those leaders out there that might you know want to check in on their team's resiliency. I know the first two might be two things that you might be able to check in on, might be able to see, and the third, Jerry, you mentioned that's kind of hard to check in on. So, what tips do you have to check in? In on your team's resiliency? That's a good question. I think sometimes it's just having a very open, transparent question, uh, question Q&A. And it could be one of the big things that's so important right now is to coach your team in a one-on-one -on -one setting if you have the time and the bandwidth to do it, literal bandwidth and figurative bandwidth. Um, we, again, we don't know what someone's going through. Having just total focus on someone for even a four minute, three minute, five minute call can give them so much more than, than we even are aware of, to be thoroughly listened to, to have someone ask about how we're doing. You know, people wanna talk about what they're going through, even if it's their boss, even if it's their colleague, but we have to make ourselves more accessible to people and then we'll really find out the truth about how they're doing. But unless they feel safe, they're not gonna do it. And that's where, you know, this work that Michael and I do with psychological safety, where we assess teams and help them monitor or understand how they're doing as a as an organization as an organism um without things like that it's hard to know how people are doing so you know and we're happy to talk to you about that of course without any obligation but um that is one way to find out where someone's coming from what's really going on with them and, and why they might be holding back michael do you think have any other yeah i think you did a great job with that jerry um I think that if you're a supervisor and you have, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings like Jerry was talking about, part of your agenda can be checking in with the people at the beginning or checking in with your team at the beginning of a team meeting. Um, Jerry and I are parts of different teams where uh, whoever is facilitating that meeting does it explicitly. It's like, okay, we're going to have some check-ins at the beginning to see how everyone's doing. And, uh, you know, just because everyone's human. Yeah. Another thing that um, we've found, Ellie, that's really cool and helpful, and we mentioned on, on another webinar that we did with you, is um, if you're using Slack or some sort of a, a, a platform where you can check in in real time, every day someone either puts up a, a red, a, a green, or a yellow symbol or a light. Green means they're doing great, you know. Yellow means, eh, things aren't, you know, they're okay. 
and red, we know that that's not good. And it doesn't mean they have to tell you what's going on. It means they're just telling you where, the, where they are on that resiliency or that uh, emotional scale. And Jerry, as you know, one of uh, my clients heard us talk about that on the webinar. He instituted that with his team. And now then he started sharing it with other teams. They just, people don't have to share the details. They just say, I'm feeling a little yellow today. I'm feeling kind of red. And then the people know how to approach them. If they can reach out, see if there's anything I can help with, you know, if they're in that yellow or red zone without having to give the details. Exactly. That's great advice. I'm definitely going to take that one to my team. I think it could be really helpful just to have that quick, easy check-in to know before you G-chat, before you reach out to someone you know where they're at. Exactly. Wonderful. So are there any other last questions? Don't be shy, anyone. Okay. Looks like we might have covered all the questions. Do either of you, Michael or Jerry, have any final things you'd like to say? I'd just like to say thank you again for allowing me to be with all you Terps and it was a lot of fun as always. I want to echo what Jerry's saying. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ellie, for hosting us. We really appreciate the Alumni Association inviting us back to present. We're happy to do future engagements. Uh, for those of you that join us, you know, please reach out to Jerry and I on LinkedIn, uh, and Ellie will have a follow-up email, some more resources. We're here. We, we're coaches. We love to help. That's what our profession's all about. So you please take advantage of that. <laughs> well, we appreciate you both for your time and energy, not just today, but previous webinars. And like Michael has mentioned, we'll send out a recording of this webinar to everyone who registered. And you'll also have an opportunity to set up a 30-minute consultation meeting with either Michael or Jerry. And that's something that they've offered to you all. So I hope everyone takes them up, up on that offer. And um, has a great rest of the day and Michael I'll let you sign off with our Go Terps if you'd like. <laughs> All right everyone, Go Terps! <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Take everyone. care. Bye. Bye-bye.